good morning. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Let's stand and worship this morning. Let's sing. You're the word of God, the Father, from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the
And let me welcome you this morning to our morning service, this first service, Lord's Day of 2024. And uh, we're blessed to have you present today. Welcome to church family and a sweet welcome to those that are visiting with us today. We're glad uh, that you've chosen to be here and to be a part of this time. And uh, just our church is praying that we as a body of Christ will have a, a wonderful Christ honoring year ahead of us, and uh, I tell you, this is the way to begin uh, the year the right way. So uh, God bless you for your being present today. I want to go ahead, and I know it's in the, in the bulletin as announcements, but I just want to go ahead and say uh, God bless you, church family, and I commend you for the tremendous offering that you've given to our international missionaries uh, again this year, uh, just a phenomenal gift that uh, will be used very well and wisely and uh, so thank you for supporting our 3500 plus missionaries that serve all around the world and uh, just the diligence that you've shown the faithfulness and giving and supporting them so i think uh, as it says in the bulletin 19,123 dollars that was given by the first baptist church of Bowenton and and we just give god thanks for that and i i commend you uh, for your faithfulness in giving well, as we pray for our missionaries, we also want to add some other uh, names this morning. Uh, pray for Brian Williams uh, as he is home from a week-long stay at the hospital, uh, doing much better, but pray for him. And then Joy, uh, Robert's father, uh, is having some uh, difficulties right now and with he his health, and so let's pray for him. And then uh, Dwayne Smith's mother, Vanetta, is in the hospital at UK uh, with some very uh, serious uh, health-related uh, issues that we want to remember to pray uh, for him. Uh, Teresa Chandler asked us to pray for her son, Jason, who is uh, facing some very uh, important tests this week concerning an aneurysm that he's been battling. And so let's keep him in prayer. And uh, I know there's others within the church family who have been battling health, health issues. And so let's pray for one another uh, that the Lord will just bless and help us to be able to to press on as we spoke about last Sunday. So let's do that right now as we go and pray for them. Please take a moment and pray for yourself and just ask the Lord to just do his work in your life and just make yourself available completely to the Lord on this first Sunday of 2024. Uh, maybe this is a good point for renewal as you reflect on your life and just determining that just let the Lord know, God, I want you to be all in all in my life in this year ahead. Father, give us that desire that for this year ahead of us, that our greatest, our greatest focus and our greatest desire will be that we have the opportunity to just please you, to honor you, and to love you with all of our heart our soul, our mind, our very being. I pray that will be true of all of us as a church body. I pray, Father, for those in this, this service right now that are just facing some difficulties, uh, whatever they consist of, I pray that they would know your grace that is able to strengthen and hold us up, carry us through things like this. And I pray you would bless them, bless this body, Father, we do pray especially for Brian and for Joy's dad and Dwayne's mom, for Jason, for, for Lanny Cobb and Ken Wooten, as folks have mentioned some of the issues they're dealing with. Father, be with each one of them. Uh, bless them in the midst of their trial that they're going through. Be with their family. Give them grace that they are there to, to be alongside them. Father, we especially ask for mercy today and for you to just open our eyes today. Help us to hear through your word, Lord. And just help us, God, to make the adjustments in life that need to be made. And Father, if there's anyone here on this first Lord's Day of this year that has not yet yielded their life to Christ, we pray today would be that day of salvation for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I want to invite you to stand once again. Sing this hymn, Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor. Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my say. of me. 
scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel of Mark chapter 13 and we're going to be looking at verses 28 through 37 and the scripture says now learn this lesson from the fig tree as soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out you know that summer is near even so when you see these things happening you know that it is near right at the door truly I tell you this generation will certainly not pass away until all of these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. And he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he, sudden, if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to, ev say to everyone, watch. May God bless the reading of his word. Sing this great song together. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord all? Stop the Lord Almighty. 
morning is our scripture reading, Mark chapter 13, and we'll be looking together at the closing verses of this chapter that we've been studying together for several weeks. Uh, in December, we had a little three-part series entitled, He Came and He is Coming. And today we come to this final section that wraps up that three-part series as Jesus is kind of pulling it all together in these final verses. As if you've been here, you know that all of this began be because of questions that were asked of Jesus. The disciples, it names them in verse 3, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, asked him a couple of questions in private. And he went on to give them an answer uh, that associates with a specific time frame in world events. Now, the question that they asked him in verse 4, they asked, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? These disciples were asking questions about the end time. Now, Jesus has already told them that he's leaving, that he is going to be leaving them, and they're struggling with that. But he also had reminded that he would come again. And they want to know, when will this coming be? What will be the evidence or the signs of when you come again? And in reference to when he will come and establish his kingdom, because that is what they were hoping for. That was the difficulty they had with Jesus stating that he was going to be crucified because they thought he is coming to establish his kingdom now. And they're broken because he's making it clear that that's not the intent as far as an earthly kingdom, that he is establishing a spiritual kingdom. And so in the context of the question, he, they are asking, when will be and what will be the sign of your second coming? What, what will be the evidences and the signs? Well, he begins to tell them what those signs would be. We've studied together from verses 5 through 27 the many signs that he describes in this section. Uh, he talks about wars and rumors of wars. He talks about disease. He talks about natural calamity, uh, earthquakes and floods. Uh, he talks about things that will go on in, the, uh, the, in space as far as the stars and, and meteorites. And all of these things, interesting enough, uh, John is given a little glimpse of exactly what he was describing as he was led to the Lord to write the book of Revelation. We see all of these things described in more vivid detail in the book of Revelation of what Jesus is teaching. As we said, verse 14 is a, is a dynamic verse that, that gives us such precision about the timing of this period. 
the midpoint of the tribulation period, uh, a midpoint that Daniel had written about, that Jesus uh, basically uh, quotes and states that these would be the type of things that will happen. Now, I know we live in a world today, and sometimes as you're out and about, you'll hear people say, well, certainly there's not a lot of time left. Certainly, we are in the end times. Uh, I've heard people just a recent day saying, it's no doubt that the Lord's return is near, that he's coming soon. And so we, we sense that. We, we look at what is happening in the world, and we cannot get away from that uh, the, the times that Jesus described sure seem to fit now. And so as we come to this section, we keep that in mind. We realize the question was about the second coming. The question is about his kingdom reign, his earthly reign. Now, now one thing to keep in mind, as a Christian, we're not looking for the second coming. We're looking for the rapture. (laughs) The church is looking for an event that is not the second coming, But we are waiting with anticipation what is called the rapture of the church. And and folks, there is nothing, nothing that has to happen before that event can happen. It can happen any time. It can happen any moment. And and that is not the question they're asking. They're not saying, Jesus, can you tell us about, you know, as far as the rapture? Can you give us the time? That's not what they ask. They're asking about his second coming. That is a totally different event from the rapture of the church. And the second coming will come at the end of this period we call the tribulation. Seven years. Seven years that Jesus talks about the tribulation here. The Bible talks about it in the book of Revelation. Daniel alludes to it in his writings and gives us precision about days and years and, and, and that time frame. And so then we come to verse 28. And in verse 28... Jesus is giving his final admonition about this end-time moment. Now, we've entitled the message, Ready or Not. And what that comes from is, as I grew up, I don't know if you folks were as sophisticated as we were in Arkansas, but we used to play a game called hide-and-seek. Anybody ever play hide-and-seek growing up? (laughs) You know, you could play that outdoors, indoors, especially if you were at a family member's house that was a very large house. You could play that indoors when it was bad outdoors. And you know how it went. You'd pick somebody and just say, you're it, and uh, the rest of us are going to hide. And you'd usually say, hey, you got to count to 20, and you can't come find us until you count to 20 or 30 or or whatever. And so they would start counting, and they'd count out loud. And boy, there you would go, scampering off, trying to find the perfect hiding place. And they would count, and if they're counting to 20, when they said 20, then they would usually say this, ready or not, here I come. And folks, I want you to know that that is exactly what Jesus is trying to say in this section. Ready or not, he is going to come. And we pray that we are ready for the next event, the rapture. But folks, if you miss the rapture, uh, you may jeopardize being ready. You may jeopardize the opportunity of being ready at the second coming of Christ. And oh, how we pray that, yes, there will be thousands and millions who will come to Christ during the tribulation period who will be made ready for the second coming. But that is what he's saying to them. This moment is coming, and there needs to be a readiness about the matters of the end times. So what does he do? Well, first of all, he wraps up what he's been saying because we see this little phrase, like in verse 29, he said, when you see these things happening. What are the things? The things are, it's everything that he's just described in this chapter. And so he's going back to reminding them of signs concerning his coming. And then he gives this parable to describe the signs. Now, as we look at this section, I think it would be well uh, that we make some clarification because this section of Scripture has been misinterpreted Uh, by many, and has led to some very uh, uh, false teaching concerning 
uh, the coming of the Lord and concerning the rapture of the church. Now, notice what he says. He said, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, that verse seems very simple, doesn't it? But what we've done, we have made it into something that it's not. Uh, we have taken, taken words here to refer to something that Jesus never intended it to refer to. Now, one example is that little phrase, the fig tree. Now, in the scripture, many times, Israel is symbolized by the fig tree. And what has happened in the past is folks have read into this something that it is not meant at all. When he speaks of the fig tree here, he is not speaking of Israel at all. Now, one of the reasons that we bring that out is because it has led to a lot of misinterpretations. Back in 1988, do any of you remember the book that came out entitled 88 Reasons the Rapture Would Happen in 1988? Anybody here remember that? Well, man, I tell you, y'all were protected, I guess, because... Back where I'm from, it was, uh, it was very, very known. Well, a man by the name of Edgar C. Wisnett, who was a Nassau engineer and a Bible student, wrote a book entitled 88 Reasons the Rapture Would Happen in 1988. And you say, where did he get that? Well, he got it from this verse. He came to this verse and said, well, the fig tree here represents Israel. And what happened to Israel? Well, something happened in 1948. 1948, May the, May the uh, 14th of 1948, Israel was recognized as an independent state. And it was given its freedom. And so 1948, well, he looked at this passage and said, well, here's the fig tree. It represents Israel. Israel became uh, uh, an independent state in 1948. Then he came on down in verse 30 and said, well, it says here, Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away to all these things take place. He said, okay, a generation. How long is a generation? Well, he determined that a generation was 40 years. And so you see where he got. Israel, 1948, became an independent state. Add 40 years to 1948, 1988. Most certainly that has to be the time the rapture of the church is going to happen. Well, 1948, 1988, 1988 came and went. So he had to write a new book. His new book was, Jesus, the rapture is going to happen in 1989. And it didn't happen in 1989. And now folks have gone back and said, well, a generation is 75 years, or a generation is 120 years. And it has led to confusion concerning this matter related to the rapture and the end times. Now, folks, what Jesus was saying here, he's saying nothing about Israel. And the way we confirm that is we confirm Scripture with Scripture because look what Jesus says in the, that is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 21 and verse 29, the same issue, the same parable that Luke is writing, and notice how Luke states it in verse 29. He said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. You see what he's saying? Jesus is just saying, just as you can tell the changes of seasons by looking at the trees, by the coming of blossoms or leaves, you realize spring is coming, summer is about, is about to be here. And Jesus is saying to these, as he has described the events that would lead up to the second coming of Christ, he's saying that just as you see the changes in the trees that alert you that summer is near, so also when these things, the signs he's described, when these things are happening, know that it's near and at the door. And then he gets very specific. And assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What generation is he talking about? Not the generation he was speaking to there. The generation that sees the beginning of the signs that he has just described in this book. He is saying there's coming a time where these signs will begin. These things will happen. And those who are alive during the beginning of these signs will be the generation that sees the conclusion of the signs. 
The generation that sees the start of all of these things, they're going to see the end of these things. He is saying there are signs that help clarify those who are living during that time, they're going to see everything that he pronounced. It's going to happen just like he said. They're going to see the start of it, and they will see the ending of it. And then he shows the confirmation that what he says is true when he says in verse 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. He is saying what I have spoken, what I have said, it is going to happen. You can believe it, but if you don't believe it, it's still going to happen. It doesn't matter if you believe it. It doesn't matter if you accept it. It is going to happen. His word is true. It is inerrant. It is sufficient. It is authoritative. And Jesus Christ is saying that my word will be fulfilled. Now, there are some that deny this. They deny the idea of the rapture. They deny the idea of a millennial reign of Christ. But I want to tell you, Christ gives such vivid details and descriptions of this event that it's hard to comprehend, to deny those things that are so clearly delineated in Scripture. And Jesus said, these words, my words, will by no means pass away. They will be fulfilled. So we begin with him saying there are these signs that alert those who will be alive to be aware, to, to recognize that as they see this happening, they will see the beginning. They will see the end. And therefore, he's given us the signs that he's coming. Whether we're ready or not, whether a person during that time is ready or not, he is coming. But then notice the second thing, and that is the secrecy that surrounds the day of his coming. Verse 32, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. One of the things as humanity, we want to know the time. <laughs> what time is it? Man, we wear watches, we have it on our phone, we've got all these things. We want to know the time. What time do we need to be there? What time do we need to leave? And we're obsessed with time. And I believe that we are also obsessed with wanting to know the time. Oh, I would like to know exactly the time, the exact day, the exact hour that these events will transpire. And Jesus said that no one will know the day or the hour. But let me tell you something you can know. You can know the seasons. He has already stated in these verses that we can be alert we can be aware of the seasons that we're going into. We can be aware that we're moving into seasons prophetically and, and scripturally that are changing, that are the events that he has uh, proclaimed would happen, will happen. Uh, we can be aware of the seasons. We can take note of the seasons. Now, folks, as I look at this, as I look at the signs that he has shown to us, and, and we can call these that we're moving into a season. And as we realize the context is dealing with not the rapture, but the second coming of Christ. Now, when is the rapture going to happen? The rapture will happen before the tribulation. How long is the tribulation? It's seven years long. That shows me that as we begin to see the signs of the times and the seasons of change that is pointing to the fact that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and that his millennial reign draweth nigh. It ought to cause every child of God who is saved and is, is awaiting the rapture of the church to be that much more alert, that much more alert because our taking out, our removal is seven years before he comes again. Now, when we look at that, that shows us that the time is a hidden time. We don't know. They won't know the date. They won't know the hour in the tribulation period of when Christ is coming. Now, you say, what about this rapture thing? You talk about it. Where does it speak of that? Well, I, I want to take you there this morning because I realize some uh, don't believe in the rapture of the church and some doubt it and uh, discredit it. But I want to show you what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, we have here a, an event described 
in a book that was written to a church that was greatly enamored with matters concerning the end times. It, they were so enamored about the coming of the Lord that many of the members of the church quit their jobs. And they said, why are we wasting our time working a job when the Lord is coming soon? And so they just quit working. But you know what happened? They got hungry. <laughs> and they came knocking on the church family's door and said, hey, you got anything to spare? I'm hungry. Paul had to write to them and say, now listen, fellas. If a man won't work, he's not going to be allowed to eat. <laughs> and he had to rebuke them that, that even though they should live in light of the end time, they should live as though that could be any day, they must still be faithful to carry out their duties to work. So he had to rebuke this church. I mean, they, their problem was not like a lot of churches where we don't even have any idea about the end times. We have no preparation for end times. We're not even thinking about the final days. And here was a church that had gone overboard on it. But look what he writes and says to them because they were, they were concerned that some of their loved ones who had died, that somehow what has happened, are they, have they missed, are they going to miss out on this great event? Are they going to miss out on this matter? And so here's what he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 13. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning those who have fallen asleep, who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he said, those who have died, they're going to be resurrected. They're going to be brought and they're going to be uh, to come along with Jesus. Now he goes on to tell when this event is going to happen. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or those who died and their bodies buried. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now take note of that. Jesus is descending from heaven. There will be a shout, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and then look what happens. The dead in Christ will rise. The bodies of dead believers will rise up from the grave. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain, that means Christians who are still alive on planet earth, will be what? Caught up together with them. Jesus doesn't come to earth on this, this verse. His feet, they do not touch earth. We meet him in the clouds. He comes halfway, we're going, to, we're going to have the first time, our dreams are going to come true about being able to fly. We're going to fly, buddy. <laughs> and we are going to be caught up together with Jesus in the clouds, meeting him halfway, and then it says, and thus we will always be with the Lord. And then notice this verse, therefore comfort one another with these words. I want to tell you something, folks. It brings comfort to me to know that I'm not going to face the wrath of the tribulation. That wrath has been poured out on my Savior, and he says that I am not destined for wrath, but I will be delivered from this earth when the wrath of God falls upon it. And this is the description of the rapture of the church. This is a time that is going to happen before the tribulation starts. I want to tell you what, folks. It is good to be saved now and not wait and a person being saved during the tribulation. <laughs> You think it costs you something to live for Christ now? It will cost your head to live for Christ in the tribulation period. It will cost people to a degree that many who have heard the gospel now will deny it and reject it then. Because if you can't receive the gospel when all it basically costs you is walking down an aisle and say, I just want people to know that I'm aligned with Jesus and I've trusted him as my Savior, you probably aren't going to walk down a a road and, and proclaim that you're a, a, a child of God in the tribulation period when it will mean you'll no longer get anything to eat and you'll probably lose your life. And so there's a secrecy to this coming, the time of the second coming. It's a hidden day. But I want to tell you something. It is a wonderful holy day. It is a holy time because one does know the day and one does know the hour, and that's God the Father. And everything is right on time. He's never late. He's never early. And that time is coming. Now, we cannot know the time of when he's coming again.
but we can certainly recognize the seasons of the times. And folks, as we said, we already are seeing some of the, the seasons. We're starting to see the blossoms on those prophetic trees. We're starting to feel the birth pains that we see. But that time is going to intensify. And I would challenge all of us that know Christ that we will be found faithful uh, during this time that we live. And then last of all, last of all, we see the seriousness of the coming of the Lord. In verse 33, he says, Take heed and watch and pray. For you do not know when the time is. And notice that word watch. It's used in verse 33. It is used in verse 35. And it is used uh, also in verse 34. Three times. Watch, 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 watch. That word means to be awake. Be attentive. Be alert. Be aware. And he says watch and what? Pray. Be alert and pray. Be alert, be attentive, be awake, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And then he gives an illustration. It's like a man that's going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to, and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. So therefore watch, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether it's in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Folks, here Jesus is giving a very somber, somber warning to those who will be living during the tribulation, the wrath of God that will fall before the coming of the Lord. And he is saying that is a time where there must be an alertness and, and a time of being alert and awake. And for those who are saved during that period of time, they will have to be alert and pray. But folks, if that command is for that time, then how much more is that also for our time? We are not looking, I said, for the coming of Christ. We are looking for the rapture of the church. We are waiting for that moment that we are removed from this world. And we too ought to be alert to know that that time can happen at any time. It can happen at any moment. Will we be found watching and waiting? And pray. I think also we see here that we ought to watch and work. As we're alert, we keep up our work. He describes working, 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 continuing to be faithful to God, even though the pressures will be uh, out of this world during that period of time. And we too, as the church of God, ought to be found watching and praying and watching and wake, working until he takes us home and removes us out of this world that we live in. I hope that we will all be found faithful when that day happens. When we are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, I pray that all of us, we will meet Him being unashamed. That we will know, Lord, I was being attentive to the seasons. I was praying. I was working. I was found faithful as a servant. I hope we'll all be that way. And folks, that means just being faithful to what you know and faithful in what you do. It doesn't mean you got to be preaching a sermon when that day happens not to be ashamed. It means you're faithful to what God has called you to be, whether it's a, to be a housewife or to be a secretary or a teacher or a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer or whatever it is that your occupation in life is, that this is what God has called you to do, you'll be found faithful in that, faithful in it. Someone once asked, I think it was Martin Luther, said, what, uh, what do you hope to be found doing when that day comes that you're called home? And he said, you know, if I knew that I was going home tomorrow, I would go out and plant a tree today. And they said, what do you mean? You mean you wouldn't go out and be preaching a sermon or sharing the gospel? He said, no, I would just be doing the will of God for that day. <laughs> I would be found doing the will of God. If the will of God was for me to plant a tree that day, I hope I would be found planting a tree that day. How about you? How about you? Are you ready for these end time events? Have you made the preparation that will allow you to escape the worst judgment that this planet has ever 
experience? Have you made preparation by acknowledging that you are lost, a sinner without Christ, but that you can be saved as you repent of your sin and place your trust in Jesus Christ to say, I yield my life to Jesus and I trust Him. And you receive the most wonderful gift, the gift of eternal life. Have you made that preparation? I encourage you today to come and be saved. If you've never received Christ, come today to say, today I want to be delivered. I want to be saved. I want my sins washed and forgiven. I come to yield my life to Christ. And I would challenge all of us who have. I hope we'll be found walking faithfully with Christ. That on that day when we have an out of this world experience. (laughs) Meeting our Lord in the air. That when we meet Him. We will stand before Him with gratitude and love. But also we'll stand before Him being unashamed. That we've been found faithful. And Christian if you're here and say I haven't been faithful. You can resolve that today. We call it renewal, repentance, recommitting yourself to what Christ has called you to. I love the phrase, renewing my vows to the one that I was saved by. And maybe you need to do that, starting the year off this way. And so we invite you during this invitation to come and say, I want to be found faithful. I want to be found watching and waiting and working. And so you do what the Spirit of God has laid on your heart to do. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation together. But if you have a decision to make, we're going to invite you just to step out from where you are. Some may just say, I just want to come and pray. I just need to ask the Lord. I need to apologize to God for my life, my faithfulness to Him. And so we invite you to come. As you stand and as we sing, you come.